know, the numbers that turn out the election total, everything. How, how much can we trust the numbers that we're going to see, do you think? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, it depends on what the numbers are. If the numbers go into sort of 80s and 90s and 110% turnout in Chechnya and Dagestan, we'll, we'll know that's not the real numbers. Um, I think there will be a lot of, uh, you know, Navalny's strategies to put out a lot of observers there uh, and to <coughs> expose it, um, you know, if the, if the numbers are uh, vastly exaggerated. The Kremlin is taking this quite seriously in the sense that they don't take it for granted that they can just sort of draw knots next to the turnout figures. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be putting out this whole spectacle with Tierney uh and others. And they are putting out a spectacle because actually the turnout figures do matter. Um, not in the way that we think of an election. But, and in the same way, the election itself matters. You know, it might seem bizarre that, you know, Putin bothers with elections at all. But actually elections do matter, not necessarily for the reasons that they matter in the West, but in terms of um, in terms of legitimacy going into the next six years and and how does that whole Putin period end. Uh, the elections do matter and the turnout matters. Um, so uh, you know, and the Kremlin is is rightly uh, is rightly very worried about it. And, and you covered the last election. <coughs> you were about to say something, weren't you? Well, what I was going to say is, even going back to the Soviet period, I think carrying out a non-competitive election has always been a very risky gambit for Russia because um, <coughs> because if it, if the appearance of competitiveness or the appearance of democracy falls apart, and it's very obvious to everyone. And this has damaged them in the past. We saw it in the Duma elections <coughs> in 2011, um, and it has been a kind of trouble spot for this entire system for many, many years. So I think the Soviets used to send out agitatori to um, knock on doors and make sure that ev make sure that everyone living in a housing block would show up. They really tried to, I mean, they put a huge effort into this because what happens when you have a fake election and no one shows up is your entire regime is compromised. I mean, you covered the elections in 2011-2012. Obviously, Sena Sobchak played a slightly different role in those days. Can you talk us through a little bit? She is kind of, as it were, the, the, the one interesting point in this <coughs> rather boring um, crusade. Um, can you talk a little bit about her and what she's doing? Right, she's an insider-outsider. Um, similar to, I suppose, Prokhorov in, in a way. She's obviously allowed to go about her business, but her position is ambiguous. Her father was Putin's mentor, um, in many ways sort of brought him into politics, and she, I don't know if this is true, maybe you do know, uh, is said to be his goddaughter. She's not. She's not. But she has a long-standing family relationship with him that probably gives her a kind of hunting license that others don't have. I also think that um, the indication is that she's doing this with um, his approval. But I did see an interesting theory on Twitter last week, mm. um, which is that maybe they're lining up seeing a subject to be the next president. Sure. <laughs> How do you feel about the senior sub chat? You should have some water. <laughs> yeah. um, um, okay. Really, the question is because actually the interesting question is not who's going to win this time. The interesting question is who's going to win next time, right? <clears throat> right. And I mean, yeah, that has been, that's one of sort of 763 theories of, of, of who might be being lined up for, for the next elections. I mean, you know, she's, I, I guess she's interesting for the fact that so she can go on television and say things. Um, that up till now, you know, she can say things like Crimea is, according to law, Ukrainian, which if anyone else says, would risk spending five years in prison for saying. Um, so it's sort of opened up the debate in that sense. But there's a feeling that actually, you know, she being there saying that is more about marginalizing liberal voices and about kind of consolidating them. And, you know, whereas, I mean, I remember going to um, Kazan with Prokhorov in 2012. He was playing the kind of subject. He was role. playing the same role, yeah, the sort of you know oligarch he clearly been, and, and actually playing it. I mean, he was more careful in what he said than Sobchak is. He didn't say anything about Putin, 
um, and didn't really make a secret of the fact that I mean it was a bit of a stooge run. Um, but I think you know I saw him speak to these students and they're you know they're people that actually um, were quite enthused by what he had to say and they came out of this lecture saying oh I was a bit skeptical but I'm definitely going to vote for him. And, you know he got I think was it eight or nine percent of the vote in the end. I mean he he did pretty well and he got more in Moscow. Uh, whereas Subchak, I mean. She sort of doesn't really appeal to anyone because the liberal base kind of thinks she's a sellout. Everybody else thinks, well, you know, she's this rich socialite. Uh, so, you know, if Prokhorov was the sort of imitation candidate, she feels like, the, you know, the imitation of the imitation is like even less sort of serious. I mean, there definitely was an impression that she stepped away from the Bolotnaya movement when it became truly dangerous to be in the middle of it. I mean, it is a <laughs> the, the question of the succession now. I mean, Putin is, to be honest about it, six years' time, by 2024, he's going to be getting on a bit. Um, he's going to have to stop being president for six years after that if the Constitution is unchanged, and he's never shown any sign of wanting to change that bit of the Constitution. Um, in any personalised political system, the moment of succession is the dangerous moment. So do you have any you know, theories about this? Um, yeah, and that's the question that weighs in everybody's minds in Moscow, even before the election. I mean, the talk in Moscow, you go to you know, fairly high officers um, in the Kremlin, you know, talk to people in the Kremlin, around the Kremlin, in very large Russian state companies, and the only talk is about succession in the sense that this whole period has already started. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, we have to be careful with terms. You know, Putin is called a president. He's not a president. He's not, you know, he's not there because of the election. He has legitimacy. That is not to say he doesn't have legitimacy. It does have legitimacy, but it's a very different kind of legitimacy. You know, he is a Tsar figure. You know, he is he is a kind of a Franco uh, figure, if you like. He has a direct popular appeal. His legitimacy rests on uh, perceived or real support of the people. Uh, this magical eighty-six percent figure. Uh, nobody else in the in in the system has legitimacy of their own. Everybody's legitimacy stems from him. So the appearance of that legitimacy is, is extremely important. He is not going to, because he is not the president who is there because of the election, uh, he is president that he is the leader of Russia because of his victories, be it victory in the Chechen war, be it the annexation of Crimea and the war in Ukraine, be it uh, the shaming and sort of exposing the West and, and Trump. He is there because he is victorious. Um, even Russian czars, you know, if you think back to uh, Nicholas II, Nicholas II was, was a Tsar but loses his legitimacy as soon as he loses the war or loses territory. So that, that's very important for, for Putin to uh, reaffirm his legitimacy and, and then how he remains in power. I don't think that at the end of six years he's suddenly going to retire and disappear from the scene. Uh, he'll have to transform uh, his role into something else. Uh, it can be a uh, Deng Xiaoping type uh, figure, it can be Ayatollah Khamenei type uh, figure, but he's going to stay on the scene. He can't really leave and in the way that Yeltsin did. So how that transition is managed, what role he assumes after the six years, is obviously very important to everybody in the elite and everybody is very unnerved because, because of the confrontation with the West, I think it was Alexis de Tocqueville who, who wrote, you know, wrote, if you want to understand how a system works, you need to understand how the, the process of inheritance mm. works. Uh, how does, you know, and this is what undermined the Soviets ultimately, because they didn't know how to transfer <coughs> their wealth to their children. Uh, Putin has the same problem in a way, and the people around him have the same problem. Now with the confrontation in the West, this problem is tenfold, because in the past, the way they did it was through Western jurisdictions as well. You send children abroad, they, you bought them property, you bought them <coughs> companies. These companies then get legitimized, so that, that's the channel. This channel has now been eliminated, which is what, what is creating this extraordinary nervousness. One thing that Ellen said I think is very, very important and, and is worth, well worth dwelling on in terms of an election uh, is, is bringing, um, you know, reminding us of the Soviet elections, which, is, which was a very weird procedure. Um, you know, I was. I grew up in Moscow. Uh, my parents uh, went to vote in the school where I was studying because that was the polling station. Uh, it was a sort of a charade, and you, 
Alan's absolutely right that you know the work the, the Soviet state was very interested in, in getting people to the polling station. Even though there was one candidate and the Communist Party had complete control over the country, the KGB. I mean, why did they why did they bother? Another question is very important. Why did intelligent people in Moscow, in well, not Moscow, just everywhere in Russia, <coughs> bother to go to the polling station? Because actually you didn't face any prosecution for not going. Nobody ever been put in jail or punished for not turning up at those elections. People did it <coughs> of their own accord. And the reasons for that, we live in a sort of a paradigm which has been sort of drawn in a way by the victims who became the victors after the Soviet collapse. Um, you know, Václav Havel, Solzhenitsyn, etc., who painted the system as a binary, uh, you know, here are the dissidents and here are the communist activists who repress the dissidents, and that's it. <coughs> it's not a bipolar system. Uh, there is a wonderful book um, by a anthropologist, sociologist uh, called Alexei Yurchak, called um, I think it's called "Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More," where he he actually describes the people sort of in the middle of these two poles and and why they go to the election. And the, the the reasons are actually quite complex, and that that people wanted to go to those elections to establish that they are subjects, to in a way to establish their agency. To prove that they they are part of the country, they have the rights. Uh, they will draw the benefits, you know, of healthcare, education, etc. But they wanted to be part. They chose to be part of the country and part of the system, and they, they didn't necessarily see, you know, the the language of the party as as lies, which was becoming increasingly irrelevant. But. The, re the motives for why people go to these elections and how it's perceived and what are people trying to prove through them is much more complex than, than we think. And we have, we're so, I think we would be making a mistake if we continue to see it as sort of a bipolar, simple system. I spent some time with Sapchak talking about Sapchak. Um, you know, she makes no, uh, yeah, she talks about being used by the Kremlin. Uh, in her view, that's absolutely fine. That's how politics work. Uh, somebody always uses somebody. You know, the Kremlin uses her. She thinks she's using the Kremlin. And she reminded me of the fact, I don't think she's completely, you know, sincere, genuine, or the parallels work exactly, but she reminded me of one interesting fact, that her father, <coughs> who was the mayor of St. Petersburg and Putin Manta, joined the Communist Party in 1989 which is the oddest kind of time to join the party when everybody's heading out of it, he is joining in. And it says you know, he joined in because he wanted to make impact. Being inside, you can make greater impact. You can push the system from the outside. She knows that the only reason she is there on the scene is called Alexei Navalny. Everything that the Kremlin is doing is ultimately in response to what Navalny has done. And the Kremlin had to put out a spoiler figure, allow her to talk, but the, the field, the political field, has already been widened, it's already <laughs> changing. Uh, and we, I don't think we appreciate quite how, how much it's changing. We're going to get to the Navalny, sure. That ties in very much with some of what you've written in your book. It's a very good book. <laughs> um, um, about the, the Putin's role in trying to create something for Russians to believe in after the 1990s and the role of the, the great victory as this sort of rallying point. Um, do you think, I mean, that the idea that in the Soviet Union you just go and vote because that's what you did, that obviously that doesn't really follow anymore. But, but to what extent is there something that people believe in that would mean they'd actually bother to go and vote, do you think? I mean, I don't, I, I think, you know, I think he's been uh, very successful in sort of creating, uh, creating a sort of, you know, country, right, and that's you know partly what Arkady's book's about as well. Uh, you know, the sense of of a Russia which wasn't really there when he came in. Um, but I, I think that that starts to become slightly parallel to, you know, you, you can believe in this Russia and not necessarily 
believe in Putin. Um, and you know, my sense is, I don't know how you, whether you feel that that sort of Soviet thing you, you talk about has changed, but my sense is, you know, really, when you strip out um, the the sort of hundred percent of people will get in the uh, most of the ethnic republics or some of them, when you strip out the people who are told by their you know state bosses to go and vote and send a picture of the bullet bulletin or, or whatever, uh, when you strip out uh, those people, uh, actually you're left with quite a small number of people who are like you know it's my civic duty, I'm going to go and vote. I mean there was this extraordinary video clip that. Uh, at least yesterday, nobody knew quite knew who produced it, but it was going viral. I don't know if you'd seen it, where this this guy goes to bed on the eve of the elections, um, and his wife says, you know, let's put the alarm clock on in the morning to go and vote, um, and he says, you know, why are you going to vote? It's pointless. Uh, and then he wakes up in this nightmare tomorrow, where every every Russian has to adopt a gay person. So there's a gay person in the kitchen. Uh, two Russian ar two Russian army sergeants come to call him up. One of whom is black and says, "You've got to fight for America now. This is the new president." Um, and you know, then he wakes up in this this horrible sweat and is like, "Oh my God, I must go and vote." Um, this is you know pretty a disgusting and b desperate. Um, but but you know, I get the sense that, that there isn't um, that you, you know, and, and again, that, so Putin's. Putin's ratings are real, obviously, but my sense has always been that, they're, and, and more and more as time goes on, that they're quite fragile, that they're quite shallow. So you go and you meet somebody and, you know, the first question is, do you support Putin? And the answer is yes. Uh, will you vote for him? Well, you know, maybe, I suppose, if I'm going to vote yes, I will vote for him. Uh, but, you know, it's so predicated on the fact that there's no alternative. Uh, you know, it's like, do you support the one place in the neighbourhood that you can buy lunch. Well, yes, because if you destroyed it, I'm not going to lunch. But you know, <laughs> if there was a place that would open that sold you a much nicer lunch, um, you might want to go there. And so this, this, this sort of Kremlin's tactic of just making sure um, that there is no alternative, and or that you know, that when they say the alternative to Putin is chaos and revolution, they've done everything to make sure that the only alternative to chaos to, to Putin is chaos and revolution. Um, then you know that leaves a lot of people saying, well, yes, we remember the 90s. Yes, we don't want chaos and revolution. So yes, we support Putin. So yeah. But I suppose he he has conjured up these narratives repeatedly and very successfully. But he's conjured them up also tactically. So in, it seems like he um, sort of mobilizes the kind of um, this, this sort of um, army of ideologists, of, of kind of entrepreneurial ideologists that exist around, in and around the Kremlin um, when he is faced with a serious vulnerability domestically. Um, and he did that, of course, with getting, you know, with the narrative of the 90s, of the humiliation of Russia and Russia getting up from its knees. And then he did it again with the kind of um, resurgence of a neo-fascist Ukraine. Um, both of these were deeply resonant stories, but they are stories that are really for older people. Mm. And, and you wonder what is his new story going to be in this next cycle, when, as is inevitable, um, he will find himself in in real trouble in various places. And I would just remind everyone that in the 2011 elections, he got less than 50%, not he, in the Yedina Rasia got less than 50% in Moscow. And this um, was an extremely bad sign for Putin and something that he will not forget. And just to back, another very important figure which people tend to forget is if you look at the results of a man who most Russians knew was a fake, okay, Dmitry Medvedev. Medvedev got in the 2008 elections, and I don't think this was actually a rigged result, and it was actually quite worrying for Putin. Medvedev got the highest number since Yeltsin's elections. Medvedev got something like close to 70%. And, the, and even though he was fake, the agenda sort of attached itself to him. Mm. You know, he didn't do anything for it, but there was there is a underneath all this kind of facade there is a demand for a different kind of a state, for a different kind of a country, and this agenda finds it will attach itself to anything. It will attach itself to a refrigerator. <laughs> but uh, that actually the the low result of United Russia taken together with Medvedev's high rating shows uh, I think quite convincingly that this eighty percent figure. Uh, this magical 86% uh, that Sean mentioned 
Zapsic. It is just a statement that he is there. It's not active support. Mm. He is there. He's been president for 18 years. People are asked effectively to reaffirm that he's been there. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, the bargain, the Putin bargain was always he gave prosperity, everyone else just let him go on with it. You know, that works with a sort of annual growth rate of the economy of sort of 7 8%. So obviously, less successful model than 1 or 2% growth. Is this, I mean, it's a slightly worrying prospect considering he's responded to this by invading places. The bargain is dead. Right. Mm. The bargain is totally dead. The bargain was based on two, it was like a Yanis, it was, it was a, the bargain was twofold. The bargain was with the Russian people saying, I will, I will improve your living standards and I will improve your sense of self-worth. I'll give you some pride. And I will protect you from, both from the West and from the egregious oligarchs and the elites. There was the bargain to the people. The bargain to the elite was, I will protect your wealth, I'll legitimize it, and I'll protect you from this dark mass of angry Russian people. And I will be the mediator. Both sides of the bargain have now been broken. The living standards are not increasing. Uh, the elite doesn't feel protected or legitimized. And the thing which is broken above all, and which is all opinion polls now, all the sociologists are registering, is the growing resentment, and this is not a resentment about falling or stagnating living standards. It's resentment about uh, sort of the, the 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 Channel One, you know, the state television doctrine of imposing some traditional values, telling people to jump, you know, into into icy waters because they're Christians, uh, telling you know whatever they're telling you, you know, the state started. The idea was the state would never interfere in your private life. The state started to interfere in your private life. It's telling you what not, what to watch, what not to watch. Ksenia Sobchak, who was benefiting from, like everybody else, from this uh, oil petrodollars windfall in the early 2000s, has the police bursting into a flat, dragging out her uh, boyfriend at the time. Uh, people are told they can't be gay. Suddenly, the state is encroaching on your private space, and people who've lived through and have memories of the Soviet period are responding with great anger and resentment to that. Uh, and from being a monopolist television, from being a tool of, of control over the country, has now become an irritant. You know, to the point that local governors are telling me that, you know, they're going around to their local TV stations and asking them to tone down the rhetoric because they can't contain the anger that is breeding. Sure. Um, obviously, the, the, the new bargain is, is we can't provide prosperity, but we'll invade lots of places, and isn't that great? Um, you've just been in Syria. Um, how is, how, I mean, the, the idea that Russia is now sort of on the hook for Syria in perpetuity is a slightly worrying one. How do you feel about the, the, you know, the Putin-Syria dynamic getting forward? Yeah, I mean, just as an aside, I mean, I think the, the new bargain is kind of, we don't really know what the bargain is, right. um, because, you know, I think before the election, we were expecting to see some kind of big idea, uh, either like a doubling down on, you know, Russia as the besieged fortress, or all this big, you know, the vague, I mean, I don't think it would have been enough anyway, but this idea that Putin was going to sort of solve Syria and be the, the world's kind of peacemaker, or perhaps some kind of rapprochement, which is obviously not possible with, with everything that's happened with, with the US and so on. Um, so, you know, we were the, the only one that seemed to be available for him was the besieged fortress. And, you know, although it's kind of there bubbling away in the background, he hasn't doubled down that. He hasn't used uh, the Olympics ban to sort of launch a whole new historical thing about kind of Russia being victimized. Um, so really, it's just a bit of a sort of a bit of a emptiness. Um, yeah, in terms of Syria, um, I was there in, in September on one of these trips that the Russian Defense Ministry organized and spent kind of four days being shown around in, in a kind of way that was completely useless to give you any sense of what was happening on the ground in Syria, but was very, very interesting in terms of uh, what the Russians were up to. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, this, this new sort of last week uh, of, of these you know, possibly a hundred or more uh, private contractors who, you know, like in Ukraine, the Kremlin has always said they're not there uh, and has given them sort of secret burials when they die and now suddenly you've got such a huge number that they can't cover it up. I Is mean, it actually a huge number, do you think? 
Well, I mean, so I, I haven't been in Moscow for a couple of months, but talking to people who have been working on this in the last couple of days, I because you know you've had these numbers from sort of seven to two hundred, and I to, I assume so. Oh, it's probably you know seven and and some kind of insane person has said two hundred, and then that's been repeated. But actually, uh, it seems people have been going talking to families and things, say, and talking to the hospitals, say it seems to have been a, you know at least a hundred people, which is extraordinary. I mean, it's it, God knows how how it happened. God knows how. They, you know, it appears uh, it appears they really weren't in proper coordination, which is bizarre given that clearly, you know, the only, they clearly didn't fly to Syria on their own. They flew on a probably on a defense ministry jet, landed at the Russian air base, and were deployed by the Russian commanders. So who knows how it happened? But yeah, I mean, even when I was there, there was a day when we got diverted and we stopped at this base in the middle of the desert, and there were all these Russians there who were not army, who were very unhappy to see us. Um, who had been there for about a month, sort of in this dusty base full of Hezbollah, kind of in the middle of the desert, and you kind of realise, wow, like they, they really are deep into this conflict, and you know, parts of their parts of their the way they looked were very professional and, and very impressive, certainly compared to you know comparing to what you saw with the the, the Russian army in Georgia, uh, and even you know the East Ukraine war. Um, but yeah, it's it's I think it's going to be messy. Uh, you know, there's so obviously there's so many competing interests that although you know Putin's got this win of, of keeping a silent power when nobody thought that was popular, uh, nobody thought that was possible. Sorry, uh, quite where this goes from here, I don't know, and I, it's it's hard to see it as anything other than a disaster internally because I think if Putin solves Syria, I mean, okay, that's great, but that's not going to get you 2014 levels of. Uh, popular excitement uh, if you know they're stuck there and every month there are a hundred dead bodies coming home then you've got a big problem I also think <clears throat> I mean it's, it's worth wondering because he has succeeded at the same um, tactic again and again when he finds himself in a vulnerable position he increases his overseas entanglements and doubles down on them um, sort of what he will come up with the next time around, because I don't think that there is an easy answer to this. His um, commitments are accruing, and I think the commitment, obviously, of Syria is is so much so much more um, sticky than the commitment to Abkhazia. Um, and I just wonder what they have in reserve. Maybe. Maybe you have ideas. I, I um, to, I, before we go, I just, because it's obviously quite important how America is going to respond to it, assuming you know he invades or annexes country X. Mm. Um, America has reacted negatively to him doing this to date, mm. um, uh, and that's quite important, right? Because then that impacts on what Arkady is saying about the bargain being broken. More sanctions, then the Russian economy struggles even more to obtain the capital it needs to grow and you know and we get stuck even deeper in this hole when he needs to invade somewhere to get out of it again. I mean it's 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 a bit of a downward spiral in that in that regard, right? I guess I would say, and I am not reporting on American Russia policy right now, that it seems to me that there is a Trump policy and there is an administration policy and that these are two uh, distinct policies. So um, Trump would have liked to roll back these sanctions, but it was passed with a veto uh, sort of veto proof margin. Um, additionally, I you know, there's just been approval of lethal aid to Ukraine, which again is um, is not part of a Russia friendly rhetoric that we may be hearing from the president. So I think there are two different things going on and it's worth paying attention to that in the long run. Um, Putin in any case does not have the foil of an overtly aggressive United States and to me that is the that is what the United States means to him, that is what is most useful to him. <laughs>